Welcome to St. Luke's Online Church. Let me welcome you in the name of our King, our Lord Jesus, the one who brings us God's salvation, who, who purifies our hearts. It's so good to gather in the name of Jesus in this virtual way and to continue our series in the story of Elijah and Elisha. These prophets of Israel. Today we consider the theme, the Lord's care when his servant's work is done. And and the account of Elijah being taken up to heaven by the chariots of Israel. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, a wonderful episode and layers of meaning in this story for us in 2 Kings chapter 2. Useful application for our lives. Well, as we come into our great God's presence, of course, our first act as disciples, as creatures, as his children, is to grasping his goodness, his mercy, his revelation of himself and the call to take this journey of faith and repentance. Our first step in that journey is to pray. And so week by week we have a prayer for the week that uh, draws us into the presence of God, reminds us of his character. And so let me lead you in our prayer for this week. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Of course, as we come before God, we also come face to face with ourselves. Our knowledge of the Lord leads us to know ourselves more deeply and more fully, including those parts of ourselves that otherwise we'd rather not notice, not think about, or what the Bible uh, calls our, our sin, the way Part of our heart still tends toward disobedience to God, putting other loves before our great God. And so week by week we have a prayer of confession uh, to ask for cleansing, to ask for forgiveness, to ask that our hearts would be united again in love for our God. And so let me give you an opportunity now to reflect on your own heart And then we'll say this prayer of confession. Let us pray. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, the good news of the gospel is that we have a a representative who stood in our place, a substitute who took on the penalty of sin, a sacrifice with the power to cleanse us, A hero who broke the power of sin that we might live free lives, that being Jesus. So if you rest in him, if you know him, if you trust in him and you meant that prayer, you're turning to him to seek to follow him, uh, then you are a forgiven and a liberated person, liberated from the controlling power of sin, cleansed in your heart by his sacrifice. That's the gospel and that's good news. We continue now in our scripture reading, and we have one reading picking up the story of Elijah and Elisha, perhaps one of the better known episodes in that story, 2 Kings chapter 2. We'll be reading from verse 1 through to verse 18. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah 
said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I'll not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I'll not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I'll not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they'd crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. And when he'd struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we your servants have fifty able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So he said, send them. And they sent fifty men who searched for three days but did not find him. And when they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, He said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? Well, this is the word of the Lord. May God add his blessing to this reading. May he work through his words to renew our minds and hearts today. Well, we continue this series. And uh, in our text today, Elijah is hanging up the boots. Elisha is receiving and running with the baton. The 2020 AFL Grand Final was a special Grand Final, wasn't it? Not just because it was the final at the end of all the pain of the restrictions and somehow the AFL season got up and there was hubs and somehow some kind of fixture could be played and uh, we had some finals and then we had a Grand Final. And so it was a special final for that reason, but not just that. Not just that. In a way, it was also special because the Tigers triumphed again. But that, wasn't, that, what, that too wasn't the only reason the final was special. The final was special because I think uh, it was 
It was so special because it was the last AFL game for Geelong legend Gary Ablett Jr. Though the Cats lost the game, Ablett Jr. put in a courageous performance. He took a, soldier, uh, a, a shoulder injury early in the game but played on. Later on it was revealed that his shoulder was actually broken. Courageous performance and in a way, you know, a, a, a fitting, in a way, a... a, a, a uh, a little taste of, of what his whole career had been about. After the presentation of the Premiership tro Trophy, the victors, Richmond, refrained from the customary victory lap around the Oval. And instead, they paused their celebrations to offer Ablett, Gary Ablett Jr., a guard of honour, paying him his due as a legend of the game, now hanging up the boots. Bruce McAvaney, expert broadcaster who covered the event for the TV broadcast, described the moment beautifully. He said this, The little master, that's Gary Ablett Jr., the little master has given us so much joy. He's left a legacy that's hard to match. Tonight, Dustin Martin has continued one that is unparalleled. And so one sporting great retired in that grand final. And with great honour, and another hero took the baton of AFL elite sportsmanship. The hopes of thousands of fans on his brow. In a similar way we see in today's passage, a legend hang up the boots and the mantle of leadership pass to another Elijah hangs up the boots, retires from his prophetic office. The mantle of leadership passes to Elisha. And what I want to point out as we reorient ourselves to this story is this. This is an answered prayer for Elijah. This is an answered prayer for him. For Elijah has longed for prayed for rest from his ministry for some time. And so being the good Bible students we are, we consider the key context to our chapter before we look at the chapter itself. And I want you to remember the piece of key context, Elijah under the broom tree, 1 Kings 19. Do you remember that story? Do you remember that episode? Back in that chapter, 1 Kings 19, Elijah was overwhelmed by the threat of the queen's persecution he felt utterly alone in what seemed to him to be a hostile world he fled Jezebel's reach and ended up at breaking point exhausted a day's journey into the wilderness outside Beersheba and with this prayer in his heart on his lips let me read his prayer again remember it 1 Kings 19 verse 4 I've had enough Lord Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Well, in the story then, the Lord came to him, manifesting his special presence at Mount Horeb, speaking to him, not in harsh words, coming to him, not in powerful discipline, but in a gentle voice. And then the Lord revealed his plans and purposes, how he was going to snuff out the legacy of Jezebel, the idolatry, the worship of foreign gods that she introduced. And then the Lord revealed too, didn't he, that he had a successor prepared. Elisha. Sometimes the best way forward when we feel overwhelmed is to get some good help. And so God gave Elijah, when he felt overwhelmed, some good help in his assistant Elisha. But back to Elijah's prayer under the broom tree. Take me, Lord, I've had enough. It's, it's key context to our chapter today. Because in our chapter today, in 2 Kings chapter 2, that prayer will be answered. As we look a little closer at our text now, our first reflection is this. In our passage today, we see the Lord's care when his servants work. Is done. And I want you to think back on that picture of Elijah under the broom tree. 
a day's journey into the desert outside Bathsheba, feeling alone and hopeless. That prayer for rest on his lips. In our text today, we see the Lord's response in the Lord's best time, in the Lord's best way, in the Lord's best time. Here in 2 Kings 2, in the Lord's best time, he took Elijah to heaven. Not in Elijah's timing. Not back in 1 Kings 19 when he was in the pit of despair. Not then. That wasn't the right time. The Lord still had some work to do on him, on him, didn't he? Strengthening Elijah, gently encouraging him with that still small voice. And we've covered that already. The Lord still had some work to do on him. And, of course, the Lord still had some work to do through him. Through him. And we saw that in last week's talk, didn't we? In the matter of Ahab and the theft of Naboth's vineyard. It was Elijah who was instrumental in challenging Ahab. And so there, that's a sign of this new season of God works, of good works, this new season of good works that God had for Elijah even after the broom tree episode. There was a, a season of good works coming in God's timing. There were good works to do. Good works to do. In today's passage, uh, we see too uh, that uh, there must have been uh, a circuit that Elijah travelled encouraging communities of prophets. A and a number of those communities are mentioned in today's text in, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 2. Uh, in Bethel, verse 3, in Jericho, verse 5. And so part of Elijah's work, uh, the work that God had him to do, the season of good works, uh, was, of course, to build up and encourage and raise up these prophets. So Elijah, Elijah has had vital work to do in the providence of God since the broom tree incident in 1 Kings 19. The Lord wasn't ready then to take his life because he had work to do on him, bringing him out of this pit of despair, and he had work to do through him, a season of good works. But now it's time. According to verse 1 of our text, it's time for the Lord, we read in verse 1 of 2 Kings 2, was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now is the Lord's best time. Now, after Elijah has had encouragement from all the work that the Lord has done, after the Lord has pulled him out of his pit of despair, now is the time. And what I want you to do is stand back and ponder how kind God is in this to his servant. How caring the Lord is. All the way through Elijah's story, the Lord extended a personal line of care to him despite all that was going on around him. And now the Lord again expresses his care for his servant, choosing the best moment to take him to himself and giving him the most wonderful honor at his departure. Okay? Gary Ablett Jr., the little master, got a guard of honor from the Richmond players. In our text today, Elijah is granted an even greater guard of honor than a premiership winning Tigers team lining his path. I mean, you might think Dustin Martin is, is pretty powerful and uh, amazing, but we read in our text today of an even more amazing guard of honor given uh, Elijah the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Amazing. Uh, verse 2, uh, sorry, verse 12 of our text. Who are they? Well, they are the leaders, the leaders of God's angel armies. Okay, so we need to enter the worldview of our Bibles to understand who these, uh, who these horsemen and what these chariots are. Uh, well, well <clears throat> the chariots and horsemen of Israel are the leaders of God's angel armies. We've met from time to time the angel armies of the Lord in our Old Testament. Uh, we saw them fight for the pure worship of the Lord at the time of the conquest of the land. Okay? More than being for Israel at the time of the conquest, the angel armies 
were for pure devotion to the Lord. They were for pure covenant faithfulness, pure worship, and against idolatry. So they brought judgment on those nations that so greatly offended the Lord by worshipping gods that aren't gods. And, and you can see uh, those angel armies mentioned in Joshua 5 in the account from verse 13. We saw the angel armies fight for King David as he sought to establish a strong and united kingdom. Okay, And, and we read, of course, in, in the accounts of King David that he was a man after God's heart. And he's establishing this strong and united kingdom, this, this place on earth where the, the qualities of God's kingdom, truth, justice, could be manifest. Now, of course, the angel armies are going to be interested to see that happen, aren't they? And so they fought for David. They fought for the kingdom of God manifest on earth at that time in the way that was appropriate for that season of salvation history. And uh, you can read about their involvement in that moment of Israel's history in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Certainly Jesus taught the reality of angels. Here are two examples. Matthew 16, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels. And he's talking about the, the end of the human story as, as we know it, the end of life on this earth as we know it, the wrapping up of all things. And he says the Son of Man is going to come in the Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according uh, to what he's done. So the Son of Man will come with his angels. And then in Matthew 18, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Perhaps the picture there is of uh, children who belong to the faith community having the special protection of God's angel armies. And so we put all this together, all these descriptions of the presence and the activity and the purposes of angels in our Bible from Old Testament to the teaching of Jesus and we can describe them like this. They're spiritual beings with personalities that serve the Lord's purposes. Spiritual beings with personalities that serve the Lord's purposes. They exist in armies with heavenly soldiers and commanders over them. In other words, not in families. Okay, So they exist in armies and, and that speaks to the fact that they're completely given over to the Lord's mission. We could conclude that they are at war with the evil one, with false worship, with lies and with all injustice. God's angel armies. Here chariots, heavenly horses and horsemen from this heavenly army provide a guard of honor, a guard of honor for the prophet Elijah at his departure from this world. What a high honor. Another great kindness of the Lord. A beautiful way for the Lord to answer the cry of Elijah's heart. I've had enough Take me, his cry back in 1 Kings 19. Here's how the Lord answers it. In great honor, giving great honor to his servant. Reading from verse 11 of our text. As they, that's Elisha and Elijah, were walking along and talking together, having crossed the Jordan, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up. To heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. Who normally? Let me, let me just try to illustrate just how much your honor is laid upon Elijah in this moment by asking you this question. Who in the ancient world, who in the ancient world is normally accompanied by chariots and horsemen. I mean, what kind of person would you have to be? What kind of role, what kind of authority, what kind of office would you have to have to be accompanied in the ancient world, uh, you know, by, <laughs> by chariots and horsemen? Well, you, you'd be a general in God's army. That's who you'd be. You might even be a prince. 
It might even be royalty, earthly royalty. Here the Lord gives his prophet the honor of a prince or a general in the Lord's service. What is the application for our lives today? Well, this. When we feel like Elijah did under the broom tree, without hope and utterly alone, and if it hasn't happened to you yet, it's going to happen sometime. Everyone has these moments of great despair, praying for it all to end. When we feel in that pit, when we feel under our broom tree, we ought to give God time. That's the application. Let's give him time. Okay? Give him time. Don't rush and take matters into my own hands. Raise a hand against my own life. Don't do that. Give God time. Give him time. That's the application, isn't it? For our Lord will, as he did for Elijah, in time, in time, give us all rest from our labors. At his best time. We can see how this was the best time for Elijah to leave this earth. After he'd been pulled out of that pit of despair. After he'd had the encouragement of a new season of good works. After he'd seen his successor emerge and had the hope of his legacy continuing. We can see, can't we? God knew the best time for Elijah to depart from this world. And he knows the best time for you and I too. So let's give him time. Let's put our lives in his hand and let's say, when you're ready, Lord, when you're ready, take me. Not when I think. So my soul trusts in the Lord that he will give me rest in his best time, in his best way. Perhaps after a new season of good works is opened up. Perhaps after I've received a taste of the honor that the Lord will one day shower upon me when Jesus returns and every good work will be revealed. And what of our second point today, our second reflection? In our text today, we see the Lord pass the baton of prophecy to Elisha. Our narrator provides at least three confirmations. It's the, in the way the account is presented to us, there's at least three confirmations or evidences that the baton of prophecy has been passed to Elisha and that he now continues the legacy of prophecy and he is an authentic and authorized prophet in the Lord's service. He's running the race now, what are the confirmations that the baton has been passed? Well, firstly, the word of the prophetic communities. Secondly, the way that Elisha is given a close-up view inside the whirlwind of Elijah's departure. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. That's a significant detail of the text. And thirdly, the miracles that Elisha goes on to perform in the power of the Spirit. And we'll remember one in particular here, the dividing of the Jordan. I want you to think of a 4 by 400 meter relay race at the Olympics. Runner one ra rounds the first, the final bend, rounds the final bend, approaches the baton handover zone, extends their hand, you know, in the hand in the handover zone, the baton handover zone, runner one extends their hand, extends the baton uh, toward runner two. And runner two has started running. They put their hand back, their, their palm open, and the baton is passed from one to the other. Uh, runner two, with baton firmly in hand, now runs on, continuing the race. So that's a picture of what's occurring in our text today. Elijah passes the baton to Elisha, and Elisha continues the race, continues the office of prophecy, speaking the very words of God with the authority of God, the power of God, the words that bring the presence of God into human circumstances. But I want to suggest to you today that Perhaps on one level, 
I just want to intrigue you a little bit today, make you a little curious, engage you in the story a little bit, and, and just suggest that perhaps on one level the baton handover, although it occurs in God's providence, it's not quite as smooth as we might first think. All kinds of things can go wrong at a baton change. Famously, in the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, the Jamaican men's team went from gold medal contention uh, to running third because as he took the baton, Jamaican runner Greg Horton fell and somersaulted, literally, fell and somersaulted. And I want, I want to ask you to reflect this morning is the hand over here in 2 Kings 2 smooth, or perhaps on one level, perhaps by one person, a little fumbled? A few more questions might assist our reflection. Where is the anointing of Elisha? Where is his formal commissioning from Elijah? The baton gets passed, yes. But it seems Elijah doesn't quite put the baton down in Elijah's open palm as firmly as he could. Okay? Elijah, the older prophet, fumbles a little. Elijah is reluctant. Okay? He wants to shake Elisha off his trail. Did you notice that? Uh, stay here in Gilgal. Don't follow me. <laughs> I'm about to depart. Don't follow me. Stay here in Gilgal. Stay here in Bethel. I'm about to go to the Lord. Don't follow me. Stay here in Bethel. I don't want you to be part of this. Uh, stay here in Jericho. Don't follow me to the Jordan. Verse 2, verse 4, verse 6. He's trying to shake Elisha off his trail. He doesn't seem to want to formally anoint his successor with oil in the name of the Lord, calling on the Lord's power and strength for Elisha. Surely before Elijah departed this world, he'd want to give his successor every help. If he was thinking rightly, you know, if he was trusting in God, if he was thinking hopefully uh, about uh, Elisha's future and the, and the future of prophecy, he'd want to give Elisha every help, wouldn't he? Uh, he'd want to... Uh, give him every enablement, a great commissioning and anointing, anointing him with oil, you know, lay his hands on him, pray over him, give the young guy every help, strengthen his platform. That's what he'd want to do, wouldn't he? But he doesn't do that. He tries to shake him off his tail. He tries to shake him off his tail. In this last moment when Elijah could have anointed his successor, he doesn't. And instead seems to have mixed feelings about him wants to slink off without enabling his young assistant. And so our text today presents a baton pass, yes, from Elijah to Elisha. Elisha is keen to run with the baton. Elijah is a little, a little incompetent, near fumbles. The good news is, in God's mercy, the handover still occurs and Elisha carries on the prophetic work. Despite Elijah and his reluctance, the Lord confirms that Elisha is certainly running with the baton and a genuine prophet. The word of prophecy confirms it. Uh, let me read again that word of prophecy in verse 3 of our text. This is what the communities of prophets say. Uh, do you not know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? They're involved you know, and they see that Elijah is, is leaving and then they prophesy again in verse uh, 15 of our text. The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And so the, the word of God through, uh, through the prophetic community confirms that Elijah has finished his leg and Elisha has begun. His leg. So that's one confirmation. Uh, but we have more confirmations. We have more co confirmations. The confirmation of Elisha's close up view of the chariots of horsemen inside <coughs> the whirlwind. Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, the spirit of the Lord. 
as Elijah departs. Give, give me a double portion of your spirit, teacher, father. Uh, Elijah responds, verse 10 of our text, you've asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, this double portion of God's spirit, this filling, enabling, empowering of God's spirit. If you see me up close, when I'm leaving, you'll know the spirit is yours for the office of prophecy. And what does Elisha see? Well, he sees the close-up view. He sees Elijah taken up by this guard of heavenly honor. When the 50 prophets are waiting back on the banks of the Jordan, all they see is the whirlwind. But Elisha sees inside the whirlwind what's going on. Elijah taken up to heaven in this guard of honor. Lastly, Elisha's deeds of power in the name of the Lord. Firstly, here parting the Jordan like his predecessor just had. Where now is the Lord? Where now is the Lord? The God of Elijah, Elisha, the new prophet, asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. So the miracle confirms that the Spirit of the Lord, the Lord is with this new prophet. The baton has been passed. The baton has been passed. The Lord watches over the departure of Elijah and the picking up of Elisha, and the baton is passed. The people have a prophet to continue the work of speaking with divine power and authority, the one who bring the very presence of God to earth, to human circumstances, through his words, the very words of God. The one who would continue the work of purifying their hearts. What, what is Elijah's chief, chief contribution to the people of God? Well, think of Mount Carmel. Think of the people renewing their faith. Isn't it purification? Isn't that Elijah's chief work? And now Elisha is continuing that ministry of purification, turning the people's hearts back to the true God, turning them away from their idols, cleansing them spiritually. Elisha will continue the Lord's mission to purify hearts and draw the people back into the covenant. But we, friends, have another, 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 greater, Elisha. And I want to conclude our reflection thinking about him now, the greater Elisha that we know in the good news of the gospel. We have a new young leader who has taken the baton of prophecy, fulfilling Every prophetic promise and purifying hearts. Indeed, this young prophet became himself the sacrifice, the only sacrifice which truly has the power to cleanse the people's hearts from their idol worship. This young prophet indeed was more than a prophet he was the very personal presence of the Lord in the flesh. And he rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. And here's something beautiful. He shed abroad his spirit on all God's people, on all God's people, never to be taken from them in a new power. New powerful dispensation of the Spirit. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God anointed and empowered the leaders of Israel. But in this new Elisha, whom we call Jesus, of course, it's Jesus I'm speaking of. The Spirit of God, God is shed abroad on all his people. Leaders and people. The rich and the poor, young and old, men and women, people of different races and nations who call on him. The Spirit of God is shed abroad on all of us as we, as we come to this Jesus in faith and repentance. And he, the Spirit, lives in us. 
never to be taken from us. More than a double portion, but a portion that overflows into our lives and our ministries. Bringing love and power to our witness and obedience. See, Elisha means, literally, in the Hebrew, do you know? God saves. God saves. We have another young leader, a better Elisha, also named after the salvation of our Lord. Jesus, whose name means literally, do you know, the Lord saves. See, he's a greater Elisha. He too is named after the salvation of the Lord. And he's lived among us and he's made himself the sacrifice we need. And he's risen and ascended to purify our worship, to purify your heart, that you might have a wholehearted devotion to the Lord, that you might tremble at his words, that you might love him more than any idol of this world, whether wealth, power and influence in relationships, control over our lives, human approval, Religious good works and traditions, these are all our idols. But he would liberate, liberate us from the power of those idols and bring us a fuller life. He would purify us, purify our hearts so that we worship God as pleasing sacrifices. Would you invite him to continue that work of purification this Lent? That work of cleansing, for to cast down our idols, is to know the salvation of God. For only in worshipping the Lord is true freedom. Only then, in devotion to the Lord, do I live in line with the very grain of my human nature. Well, let me pray. Oh, we thank you, God, for this passage. There's layers to it. And, and we've seen today your beautiful care for your servant Elijah, that you knew the right time for him to be taken to heaven. And it wasn't when he was in that pit of despair. You had good works for him to do, and you wanted to honor him through this heavenly guard of honor. Beautiful. You know the right time. You know the right time for all of us. We submit to your timing. And we pray that as you opened up a season of good works for Elijah, you'll help us to identify the good works you have for each of us and to walk in them. Thank you too that the baton of prophecy was securely passed to Elisha, despite Elijah's little fumbles and reluctance. Elisha took that baton and we have a greater Elisha who took the baton, who fulfilled every word of prophecy, who made himself the sacrifice. Praise you. Jesus, we open ourselves to be purified this Lent. In your name we pray. Amen. We continue now with our prayers for the world and the church. Let us adopt an attitude of prayer, then we'll join our prayers together with the Lord's Prayer. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us and purify our hearts. Grant to your people the forgiveness of sins, growth in grace, and the fruit of your Spirit. Send your peace to the world which you've reconciled to yourself by the ministry of your Son, Jesus. Heal the divisions of your church, that all may be one, so that the world may believe. And lead the members of your church in their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in true and godly living. And raise up faithful and able ministers for your church, that the gospel may be known to all people. Gather us with all your saints into your eternal kingdom. At your right time, Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. We lift up those known to us who might be suffering at some time, might be in their broom tree moment, feeling harassed, feeling utterly alone, struggling to see a meaningful way forward. As you came to Elijah in the still small voice, as you encouraged him by revealing some of your plans, as you gave him a good assistant, we pray that if there are those in our lives who are in that pit of despair, that you'll speak to them gently the good news of the gospel, that you'll reveal meaningful purpose for each of them, a season of good works even, and that you'll surround them with brothers and sisters who can be a help to them and be your love with skin on. We join our prayers together with the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, it's been so good to continue our series and reflect on this theme of purification uh, in Lent, an apt theme for Lent. And we have now just a moment for community news before I leave you with a blessing. Harmony Day at the cafe, Sunday, March 21, with a multicultural meal special. That looks fantastic, so note that and get down there. Parish prayer meeting, March 22, please put that in your diary. In your diary. We want to be thanking God and praising him for what we've seen him do already, even over the last 12 months. And we want to be unlocking in prayer, asking the Lord to unlock those challenges, those obstacles that the church in our state, in our nation, is facing in this period of COVID recovery. So it's a very strategic and important prayer meeting. Can I encourage you to come along? Other important features, news, not least of which the footy tipping. Uh, and I just want to underline also the Global Anglican Future Renewal Movement, uh, Information Night, just an Information Night, March 17, 7.45. Our COVID Safe Officer, Jennifer Brew, is doing a wonderful job. And there's a very helpful update from her in your news sheet if you've been emailed that. I just wanted to underline a word of thanks. Thank you for supporting Parish Council, Warden Staff, as, we have, as we've navigated opening up the church to services and programs since the start of December. And of course, because of the pandemic, which is still on, uh, there has been some adjustments we've had to make. So thank you for supporting us in those adjustments. It's a key way that we express our love for our neighbour and uh, that we, of course, uh, honour the authorities that we're under. So thank you so much. I also wanted to let you know that Parish Council will be reviewing our interim COVID safe format in May, in their May meeting. And after that review, uh, they'll, they'll use the most up-to-date up -to -date guidance at that time to review our format. And uh, then, if possible, there might be some changes after that, if possible, but... We need to respect Parish Council, allow them to review our interim COVID safe format using the most up-to-date advice at the time. So I just wanted to let you know that's occurring in May, that review. Wonderful. That's all I wanted to highlight. It's been so good to be together. Thank you too. If you are giving to us, uh, we are continually connecting with members of the City of Frankston, citizens, and we are caring deeply for our own members. We're maintaining a witness through our services and meeting real needs through our programs. 
So thank you for your giving. It contributes to all of this. Please keep it up. And uh, let's now rest in the blessing of God. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. God bless and have a great week.